Welcome to Ear Biscuits. I'm Rhett. And I'm Link. This week at my round table of dining and Rhett's, I can't actually see your table from my my got, live chat same screen. Table, same table as last okay. time. I've got the square original. The classic card Original table. Rhett and Link table. Yes. But, hey, I've switched rooms, man. As you can see, I am in front of my own skin wall. Yeah, you are. You're halfway in. You're halfway skinned, halfway unskinned. Um, I uh, I came in here because I thought there might be better acoustics. I don't know if there is. There's I think a rug. it's still pretty. There's a rug. There's also a child's bed, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I, I I came in here and I was like, Yeah, there's a there's a single Link bed. has put I would, a. I wouldn't no, call it, it a child's a, bed. It is a child's bed. It is a white bed that has drawers that on one side of it. it has a, every characteristic about this bed is a child's bed. It's a single bed, and yeah, it's got drawers underneath. It's an IKEA bed. That, that, it's kind of a vibe killer. It's kind. I just got to be honest with you. It's yeah. kind of a vibe killer. I, uh, well, it was in my garage, and it's kind of a garage killer. And I'm like, you know what? What? I bet you in that creative house, we could use a bed. That is the bed that when Britain lived in my closet for over a year, I call it a closet, but it was just a, like a, an office, a very small office. It barely fit that single bed. And it might barely fit Britain too, enough based room on to the walk. length. That, <laughs> that I'm I listen, I slept in a single bed until I got married, all the way through college. Well, I slept in a single so bed, you? but it was extra extra long. Extra long? I couldn't long? sleep in this bed. I mean, I could. I guess I could sleep on my side. But, I mean, I just... Not that we have done anything over here. We haven't here done that makes, anything over there. It's just a bed right, in a room. but like... I know, but it could be like a cool couch that you could also sleep on. And like a bed... A child's bed. A bed. I mean, we don't need a bed. It... We'll talk I about this later. I didn't need a bed in my garage, <laughs> so I put the bed over there. Have you laid on that well, bed? let's sell it. It's a. It's got a nice mattress on it. It's nice. I, I haven't laid on it. I just moved it because it, it was right here. And you know, oh, you moved, moved it, it to the other side. That's right. Yeah, because this it was up against my skin wall. You bedded my skin wall. <laughs> well, I wouldn't put it in those terms. We to okay. complete my what are thought, we talking about? Are going in an effort to continue to have a sense of connection amidst such isolation. We ask you, Ear Biscuiteer, to uh, set up some topics of conversation, some questions that we could discuss between the two of us. And we've got some, uh, we got some good conversation starters here. We got some good questions from you guys. Uh, you want to get into the first one? Hold on. Well, what, did, did we? Did you give the prompt, or we just? I mean, you kind of gave a version of the prompt. I didn't. I don't. I don't remember what the prompt was, honestly. I think it was. You've been in isolation. Yeah. Or every, you've what had you a lot been, of time to think about things. What have you been thinking yeah. about alone that we could talk about together? And, and give you Jenna definitively Temkin, correct answers. <laughs> she says, if you had an opportunity to go back and relive a part of your life, would you? By doing so, just to clarify, she says, it wouldn't change the present. You would do it more to relive an amazing experience or event that you forget. If so, what part of your life would you choose? Now, I... I love questions that don't have consequences. Because, you know, I, I'm sure in the past we've talked about like time travel or like, we definitely talked about points in, in our past that we've experienced. Um, but we, we've always, definitely talked about points in our past that we've yeah. experienced. Yeah. That's kind of our entire existence. But at I this think point. maybe we've talked about reliving <laughs> stuff, but I always get wigged out about is it going, what are the ramifications? You know, yeah. The, the fact that she so took that completely those. out, yeah. So first of all, I mean, I think that for me immediately when you add the qualifier of you, you won't change it. Well, of course, if I have the option to just go back yeah. and relive one moment, of course I'm going to do it. But I have to choose one moment. Oh yeah, I know. It's like, uh, um, do you have something in mind? Because I'm having difficulty narrowing I, I, it yeah, down to yeah, one. I, I do have something, and. You you might think that it would, you know, some of the typical answers that come to mind are things like, well, at the mo the very first moment I met my wife or my wedding day 
or the birth of my kids. One of the, I have to choose one. Um, and while all those would be candidates for me, I feel like um, I don't feel like in the moment that those things were happening, and this may be a reason to go back to them. I don't feel like I was thinking the right things in those moments or like really like experiencing them in the right way. But when I did start thinking about a moment where in the moment I said to myself, this is as good as it gets. I, I have a candidate. Okay. You okay. were there. You were there, but you weren't, you were, you were tangentially there. Hmm. We were Should surfing. I guess? Oh, you're surfing. Okay. I Oh, okay. And I think I know what you're going to say. I ca- and I caught a wave and a dolphin caught the wave with me. Yeah. And I was there and, and you were by me. me. And you told me afterward, did you see that? And I was like, yeah, I saw you catch the wave. It was great. And you said there was a dolphin in the wave and I did not see that. So can I go yeah, back and to if- see the dolphin? Well, I mean, you should probably have your own that doesn't involve watching me do something. No. <laughs> when you go back, I'll be there. So I want you to say, on this next wave, look for dolphins in the wave. And then as and then in the future, which is now, as we're having this conversation, my answer might be, remember that time that I saw that dolphin in the wave and I swam over to it and you were riding the wave and I was riding the dolphin? <laughs> well, but here's the thing. You by doing that, you would even change though something. she said you wouldn't change it, you would change the moment if you tried to ride the dolphin. Because I was riding the wave and I and it was like you know, we hadn't been surfing that long. Like catching a wave and like really catching a wave was still a big deal and it was it was one of those days where it was just a low, long, slow yeah. strong wave. So you had time to like think and experience it, you know? And then I look down and there's a freaking, the smartest mammal in the ocean besides me <laughs> is, is just sitting there just hovering in the water next to me going the same speed. And I was like, it can't get any better than this. You know what would this make it, it better? Man. Your life just peaked. If it was, if it was nighttime and you were surfing on one of those waves and dolphin was in it, but it was one of those iridescent glowing waves that's happening off the coast of California right now. Like there's people. I, is and, it still happening? And you know, I don't know if it's still happening, but I, I mean. I think it was a w- short window. As of a f- like within the past week, it was happening. And hmm, I wanted to drive and see that, but I have not done that. But of course they're opening They've opened the California beaches for, you can't sunbathe, but you can surf and you can jog. You can do like activities. And guess who bought a new surfboard? You did? Your buddy. You bought a new surfboard? I bought a- You haven't even been using the one you got. I bought a regular surfboard. I bought an 11 foot longboard because- I'm going to, I, I have to, I have to do regular surfing, man. I have to learn, I have to get where I don't have to have the paddle because I want to be able to go to like Malibu and surf without people looking at me like I'm a dork. I have to do that. I have to get to that place. I've yeah. made up my mind. So what are you going to do? You're going to start, you're going to start surfing. You're going to ask me to go and then I'm going to be out there on a paddle board. You didn't, you didn't even include me in this. Now, you if go, I'm going to go out there, go. I'm going to be that guy with the paddleboard. Well, the places that we typically go, there's a lot of people with paddleboards. And there's also people who go out, one person's on a paddleboard and like somebody else is not on a paddleboard. I think that's fine. It's just if I get where I'm good and then I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to Malibu. At that point, you have to make a decision. And by the way, I have and that another. that would be kind of late. Well, you told me that you can't paddle because of your shoulder. So I don't know what to do about that. I think that's it. Yeah, I just don't, I don't know what to do. I've been about practicing. That. I've been practicing my pop ups. I've been just out in the yard, just, just popping up. So you you ordered a surfboard and it was delivered to your house. A big honking surfboard. Eleven feet. Yeah, it's a very Good really gosh. really long. But I'm a very very big man. 
You can you be, probably paddleboard it. <laughs> it's it's, it, yeah, it's basically a my, paddleboard my paddle without a paddle. My paddleboard is not even that long. No, it's longer. It's longer or the same length as my existing paddleboard, but it's much narrower. Well, I, I I definitely miss going surfing, and now they've opened up the surf, so you can go surfing. Yeah, yeah. Again. I was going to tell you. Next chance we get, we should go. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go on my existing paddleboard, the thing that I probably have lost the ability to do because it's been so long since we've been. But I'll probably pick it up faster than you will trying to hop on one of those non paddle boards. Well, here, here's the but thing: I'm just gonna get, wait. If you, if if you just take off with it, then I'm gonna be tempted. I'm gonna be tempted to try it. I don't want to be left in oh, the and, dust. And it's not like a. I didn't get like a. I I still got a soft top. I didn't get like a. I mean, I got like a surf tech. Uh, Is that like uh, a, the board. Walmart brand or something? No, it's like the kind you learn on. Okay, you know, I it, it's still very uh, not not intimidating, and like if I hit somebody with the board, they're Won't not going to die. Okay, yeah, but eventually I will get a board that I could kill people with. My dad told me that when we moved to California when I was three years old. I remember not at three, but like at five. My dad was talking about the surfers at Malibu. He was like, "You realize that." If you go out there and you get in the way of the surfers, they'll they have really sharp boards and they'll shoot the board into your head and kill you on purpose. On purpose, mm. as opposed to on talk purpose, about territory, which is what I would be if <laughs> I went back to relive that memory. It's on interesting purpose. that you okay that you picked that. See, because my mind immediately went to th- things in my in my past that were extremely meaningful experiences that I don't think I approached it correctly, which you alluded to. Uh, so, yeah, and, and, and see, so I'm, too, I'm too worried about that. I'm too worried about going back and I, I don't know. So I picked a moment where I felt like I did appreciate it in the moment so that I could just go back and do it exactly the same way again. I, that's what, that's what struck me, but I get what you're, what you're saying. Yeah. I, and that is why the first thing that popped into my head was my wedding day because I think it would, first of all, I know that I didn't enjoy myself. I was, I was like a, I was like a nervous wreck the night before at the rehearsal dinner. I was a nervous wreck. You know, we've been through this and you know, I just, I try, when I think back on that, I try to apply that to my life now, but it's, it's so hard to be in a moment saying, you know what, I'm going to enjoy this moment because what, whatever it is that concerns you about it and with the wedding day, I can't even tell you everything I was concerned about. It was just everyone else's expectations, which is totally wrong. It's this is this is my day and Christie's day. Well, why on earth am I so concerned about everyone else's experience and everything like that? You know, I would totally have them soak it in and have a much better time. I would also get really get a kick out of because everybody that we both knew pretty much was in attendance. So it would be a way to, to, to rub elbows with everybody and have, I mean, I had a moment with everybody at like the wedding reception and, but it's like, I, I don't even remember it. It was such a blur. So I think it's, it, it's like a cheat code to have, to have one moment in time where I have access to everyone up until that point in my life that was meaningful. I had a meaningful relationship with was there for my past and and then my then present, you know? So I think, I think I've hacked it with that one. I th- I think that's well, actually, I think that's actually that my choice. Couldn't, and the fact that you couldn't change anything. So then you could go back and it isn't, it wouldn't just be about savoring it and enjoying it. You could also be like, what if I did this? Like Groundhog Day, it, it, there are no consequences. What if I just dropped my pants in the middle of my wedding? Like, wouldn't it be fun to see how everybody would react? That is my react, biggest regret knowing, that I didn't drop my <laughs> pants. During my wedding ceremony. No, but if there were no consequences, wouldn't you just do something to stir it up? I, I, my hesitancy to, in choosing a moment like that was, I, if I go back too far, I think I would just be thinking about things like, well, my body feels different. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, whereas going back to surfing like three years ago, pretty much the same guy. Like I, I wouldn't be thinking like, man, like I feel so spry right now. I'm going to run or, you know, if, like, if whatever. If we increased our do. frequency of surfing, the chances of that happening again are, 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 it's not out of the question. You know? Oh, I know. 
surfing with surfing with dolphins is actually yeah it's it's something that happens so it could happen again yeah it, but i'm not well, getting married again we surf with dolphins multiple times of course i'll be out there on a paddleboard and like i'll be able to go with the pod and you'll be just <laughs> you'll be at a, you'll be all alone i am worried about being in shape enough it, it, it's it, it, it wears you out yeah i just don't my shoulders and just like upper body strength like i don't have any chest muscles like, uh, I don't think you need. I don't think you need them. When I went, this. when I went to my you just need physical endurance. therapist guru, you know, in addition to all the things that I told you that she told me about inviting my weird rib to the party. How's that what, going? Has it come to the party yet? Um, I don't. I can touch it now a little bit. <laughs> I, I can, can touch, touch my I'm rib now. Touching it right now, but it still freaks me out. She. The first thing she did was she said, "You don't have any you chest muscle." <laughs> <laughs> she basically, it's like you show like, up. Thanks a lot. She was like, she basically told me I had a bird chest. <laughs> and I paid her for that. Right. You know, I was paying some her. People pay, some people pay for insults. It's it's a thing. I think it's like an S&M thing. <laughs> I would go. <laughs> I So I guess that's my answer. I would go back to that physical therapy appointment so I could. That was a wild ride, man. I mean, I'm, I miss my physical. I noticed everything about my life that was weird, you know, that I don't get to go out and do, like be critiqued by my physical therapist. Or, But well, we can go surfing. But, you, you know, and we'll move on in a second, but the real thing that got me going on this getting a regular surfboard, uh, first of all, I had like a foam board that is not, I went out on it that one time. I'm, just, I'm too big for it. Like it's not rated for... It was rated for like 200 pounds. I, I weighed like 220. I, I needed like a legit board that'll hold me up. But the thing I was thinking is that we've got these ideas we've been talking about with like, so we've got some surfing related ideas that I actually want to get serious about. And they require like actually regular surfing and not, not having your hands on a paddle. And so I was like, I just got to learn how to do this. Well, thanks and for the it, heads it, up. It, is all I'm saying. I mean, I would you have gone out? You wouldn't have gone out and bought a board. You no. would be like, well, you would you would have said, well, let's see how you do with yours. So that's why I haven't told you about it. I Here was just are. like, next time we go, Here we are. I'll, I'll just take my board out, and then eventually I'll get good, and you'll be like, man, you don't even have a paddle. And I'll be like, yeah, you can you can have this too. Mm. Are you gonna let me try it? Yeah. Yeah. I might. I might. I might have some hidden. Hidden ability to do it all of a sudden since the last time we did it. It's all about, we got to get in better shape. It's all about endurance. That's the only, that's the, that's the X factor. You just got to have the it's, ability to it's get all out about there knowing and ha still have energy to stand up. When to exude, exert yourself. It, but once you understand how to do something, then you can channel your exertion and not waste a bunch of energy doing all the wrong things. You know, that's true with any yeah. type of physical thing you know i'm an athlete i understand oh, these principles and i and i actually have been watching youtube videos about and, and uh, we did so many things wrong with that that day we went out with regular boards so many things wrong oh so many yeah. things wrong okay yeah i'll well, show I, you the youtube videos i can benefit from that we got another question okay. about music i'm excited about but first let's promote some merch check out we we're, we're bringing back the mythical the mythical, we're, we're associating mythical with the clown shark in a shirt. Well, yeah, speaking of the there sea creatures, which is, you know, it's interesting. That's dance. one of the things that Locke said about surfing because I was like, hey, you know, maybe later this summer, since the beaches are open and now I've got these, I've got two other foam boards that are like smaller. I was like, hey, me and you and Shepard could go. We could do some surfing together. He's like, dad, sharks. It's like, I'm really scared of sharks. And oh, yeah? I'll be honest with you. You think about it a lot. And there was that one time in Santa Cruz where I surfed a little bit that summer. And there was a guy watching us surf. And then when, and it was a big group of people, you know, Santa Cruz. And then when we got out, he was like, yeah, you know, there was a great white circling all of you the whole time you were surfing. Because he could see from the cliff. Did you believe so that? So it does happen. I, he, yeah, I mean, it does happen, but they don't, they very rarely attack, man. They're just, they're, they just, they're, they're just clowns. They don't they're attack on your shirt. Mythical.com. Check out all the stuff we got over there. You'd be surprised. 
if you haven't if you haven't checked it out in a while, look at our store, mythical.com. You'd be surprised. Rep your boys. Mythical.com, you'd be surprised. Tee up another one. Okay. Uh, JT1. Why is the music of the 70s, 80s, and 90s so good? Is it just nostalgia, or is it because music was truly epically good then, and now it's just not as good slash harder to find good music? Oftentimes, the music now is good. That is good. Has strong influence from the 70s, 80s, or 90s. Um, hmm. Well, first of all, I agree that the 70s and 80s are good in terms of music. Now, 90s, I've, I feel like you got to be more specific in order to say it's good. I don't think everything in the 90s is good. And I think that kind of gets at where I ultimately am going to pick apart JT with an A and an E stance well, on this. So my interpretation, like I agree with you. And I think the reason for that perspective, which a lot of people have, there's, I, I've got two thoughts on this. The first is the further you get away from a time period, the more it crystallizes. Yeah. And you're and not so hearing, you, you're not hearing the, like only what's worthy of sticking around has stuck around. So when you think right. of that decade, you only think about the stuff that's stood the test of it has time. staying power. Yeah. So it's not that the seventies or the eighties, I mean, well, first of all, it probably did have less music and there is more that, which is a factor. There's it more is, and yeah. more music because it's easier and easier to make music independently than it was back in the day. So as time has passed, there's just more and more music. So I guess it's more, it's easier for something to stand out, but it isn't like there wasn't a lot of different music happening in the seventies or the eighties. It's just, not all of it stuck, stuck, stuck around. And we're close, we're still pretty close to the nineties. Like, you know, people like us, that was, we were in high school. We we're in college at that time. I'll, I'll make a tangential statement, which I think might be controversial, or at least people would disagree with it. I think that hip hop now is better than it's ever been. Period. So to, to me, this is an exception. This is this is this is my personal exception to this. Is that it's it's the best it's ever been. I mean, when you go back and listen to when you listen to hip hop, it's very especially like early hip hop. I'm talking like cool 80s. OD. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you go back to the inception, it's very exciting to listen to from a nostalgic standpoint because it was just starting to bud and now it's blossomed into all different all different genres and it it changes so fast and it makes use of every it seems like every everything that catches leads to the next thing and benefits from it i mean i i love music for a number of reasons but i love that aspect of it when when jt was talking about the strong influence of the 70s 80s and 90s or basically you're just saying Music influences music influences music and it moves forward. But I, I just feel like now there's so much to enjoy and there's so many subgenres of hip hop that early on, like classic, you just didn't, you know, it it was still forming. And it's and so there's there's more to enjoy. It's 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 better now, especially because it's the whole conceit of hip hop from a production standpoint is taking things and then repurposing and remaking them, you know, between sampling and splicing and looping and all of that. Um, I just think it's better. Well, okay. I, I have the second part of my thought actually ties into what you're talking about. And I'm going to use, the NBA as an analogy, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we've both been watching The Last Dance, which I hope that wasn't going to be your wreck. We can talk, it if it be. was, it could. we can tease a wreck, go for um, it. So if you care about sports, and based on the couple of times I've said things about sports on Twitter, uh, I get the impression that the mythical beast uh, 
herd is not not a lot of sports fans, but there are some. But this Last Dance ESPN documentary about the, the Bulls, Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan is phenomenal, is one of the best things I've ever watched in entertainment, period. If, if you're into basketball Absolutely and you're our age. So if you can, if you lived through th- those seasons in the, yeah. that, that was what, 98 97. Yeah, well, they, I mean, they go through the whole, they basically, basically go through Jordan's career, but it, it, they right. really focus on the 97, 98 season. Now, one of the things that comes up a lot of times is this, you know, hypothetical conversation about how good would Jordan be now? And this is I, I, one of the, and I know you're watching it with Lincoln, I watch it with Locke. And so we're watching it with these teenage boys who are really into basketball, love the NBA. And, you know, Locke kept, leaning over during this thing. And he's like, I just didn't know he was that good. I just, I didn't appreciate how good Jordan was. Yeah. Now, but then when you ask the hypothetical question of, well, how would Jordan be if you just took him, literally you took 1995 Michael Jordan and you just put him on an NBA court now, you know, that's it. He just, he's there. And how would he do? And I feel pretty strongly that he would just be sort of a middle of the road player initially. Now, I think that he would adjust pretty quickly and become one of the, he would become an all-star most likely. Uh, but it's not a cut and dry situation. Now, the reason I say that is, and you, you actually get this when you watch the documentary, you know, Jordan wasn't playing basketball in the off season. Uh, he, he, he didn't even start lifting weights until he lost to the Pistons two years in a row yeah. and was pissed off about it. Um, Piston off, the, the, let's say. <laughs> yeah. The system that generates basketball players now is a completely different system that has been fine-tuned. You know, he was he didn't even make his varsity, This the story goes, you know, and they talk about the documentary, he didn't make his varsity team his sophomore year. Um, but now kids who are going to be and you look at the other bulls like Scottie Pippen going to like Central Arkansas or whatever. And then um, uh, like Horace Grant went to some other school that nobody a small school. That doesn't happen anymore because the system that mm-hmm. creates these NBA players at that level, their nutrition, their fitness, their practice, their insights that they get, their coaching, everything has been fine tuned and it is it is definitively better. Now you might be like, it's not as rough or whatever, but if you were to take LeBron as developed as he is and you just throw him back into that system, I think he would dominate even more than he does because of the system that he's come up in. Now, I think the same holds true in music and what you're, but I think there's something special about that time because one of the things that makes it so special is that the opportunity to innovate and stand above the competition in the way that Jordan did is something that is so hard to do. There's not going to be another Michael Jordan because the delta on the opportunity for innovation is smaller than it's ever been because the system is so efficient at producing excellence, right? And so I think the same thing has happened in music. And also the accessibility for people to create music on their own has gotten where we are just overwhelmed with really, I mean, there's, there's a lot of good music. There's also a lot of bad music because there's so much opportunity. And I just think we've gotten to a place where finding the special connection with music is harder to do than it was at that point. And it doesn't mean that it's not good or better or the music was, but the music was, let's just say, more special back when the threshold or the threshold, to, the barrier to entry to actually make music was bigger. Yeah. That's um, my that's my theory. Okay. Well, there's, there's two parts to that. I mean, I think I agree that the fact that s- s- th- there's so many more artists who who can be heard that it's 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 hard for any one artist to really pop it, i mean of course it still happens i mean you've got superstars um you've got your lady gaga's you got your drakes um but it it but it does it feel different than back in the era of michael jackson 
Yeah, because there's still you're there's still so much competition. I mean, right. Drake can't go away that long. He's you know he's got to his features have to be just as groundbreaking as his own albums or mixtapes, and you know it, it it has to keep coming in order to remain relevant. You just can't. You've got to work really hard for that because there's so much competition. The part about the system, though, I, I don't, I don't, th I think the analogy doesn't work there. I mean, if you look at, if you just look at country music and how the Nashville sound came about, and there was a whole, there was a manufacturing process around, around that, around the early days of rock and roll. I mean, you got the, um, it, you know, you've got Glenn Campbell and the, the, the name's leaving me at this point, but like the, the super group of studio musicians who are just creating, just churning. They just they just show up every day and churn out these tracks for the, for some for some singer songwriter or or somebody who's a pretty face or a pretty voice. Um, so there there was a machine for, for but it was decades. a machine based. But it was a machine based on pure talent. Like Glenn Campbell is sitting there like physically interacting with a sonic instrument to make noise. Whereas now a 12 year old is in his room with garage band and creates something. And it's just like, it, it's yeah, not was, that it doesn't by, take by time. The way, I was, I was talking about the wrecking crew, the, the Los Angeles studio based crew that brought in that that's not country music, but they but don't, and don't, but don't you think that that's, I guess what I'm saying is, and maybe this does go against my analogy. But I think that that the wrecking crew was doing something that's more special than the 12 year old in their room with garage band. Well, it, no, yeah, no, I'm not saying that no, but it's not I'm awesome, saying, but I'm just saying it's not, it isn't as special because how many wrecking crews can there be? Well, there's only a limited number of how many there can be. They, they but how many twelve out a bunch year olds can get Garage Band? Yeah, they Millions. made a lot of hits. But I, again, I think it's a. But there are still people who are making amazing music using those tools, and there's there's a lot more opportunity for true artists to to come out of the woodwork, and I th and I think that they're. You know, I, I think it, but I, I, we're so close to it. You know, I think time, t time will tell. Time will tell if, uh, are we going to be listening to My Strange Addiction, you know, 20 years from now? Probably. It, I, I think that the, I think the so. simple fact that there's, it's so clouded with so many more options over time. And because of the, re the revolution of digital music, Digital music that replicates analog music, I feel like you're going to look back and it's going to be much more difficult to recognize the sound of a decade. I think that the recognizing the sound of a decade is something that potentially died in the 90s. I don't know. I don't know if it made it into the new millennium. I just think because what's too, the difference I just think we're too close to it. I What's mean, the difference between the set, the set, what what is the sound of the two thousands versus the sound of the twenty tens? What, what's We've the already had two decades? To what's figure the it difference out. between the last Justin Timberlake album, which maybe is a bad example because I didn't listen to it, <laughs> versus the 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 last In Sync album? A whole lot, you know. I think he was wearing like a flannel on the cover of that album. I was like, say something about the woods. I mean, I didn't listen to that one, so I don't know, but. Um, well, you're right. Time will tell. I'm just saying that my theory at this point is that it won't. There won't be a definitive. Like when you think '50s music, what do you think? You think like doo wop, right? Not as good. You know, when you think '60s music, you think ah, like late starting to get into some like okay weird hippie stuff. Late late '60s, you get it gets real good. Yeah, that's when music but, started to get real good. But yeah, it wasn't okay. before. I mean, in my opinion, it wasn't before then. But then there's always something that's going to grip you since then. There's a, but it's really splintered. And I think that just to wrap it up, I think that most of what grabs me is the stuff that is calling back to the times where I thought that music was special. So there, for me, 
there's not a whole lot of music that's being made that it that isn't really heavily influenced by something in the past that I'm really into. Like I'm not into any uh, new well, genres. No, no I, I think that. But the phrase "influenced by the past," it, it, why do you have to say that? It's like that. Of course. Well, no, no. You, what, I, what I'm saying of is, course like, it's, like everything's influenced by something. All music is influenced by something. So I don't. But think you some need to things add that. are. Some things are more of a departure from the past than others. Some things call back more thoroughly. So yeah. in other words, like I'm not a, I'm not an EDM fan because it's very difficult for EDM to capture much of anything from the past because it's a very future futuristic forward looking genre, but I just don't there's no soul in it to me. I don't I don't connect with it. But that's Maybe your something's problem. wrong with me. Yeah. I I mean, and I But do you ca- I, you like EDM? I don't know enough, no, and I don't know enough about it, I, I'm, but I'm not going to say that it's not influenced by stuff because it absolutely has to oh, be. Oh, it's clearly influenced by stuff, but it's but it's a, it's a more bold departure than, say, Jason Isbell. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. You know like, I'm, I mean, I haven't listened to a lot of craft work either, but it's like, I mean. What is that? Craft work, I think, had to influence all electronic music. From the seventies, what is craft work? Craft work is um, craft work with a K and then an E. Is it a band? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, German band formed in 1970. Uh, widely considered as innovators and pioneers of electronic music, they were among the first successful acts to popularize the genre. It's just you're not into electronic music, no. But you, I mean, you'll like the Daft Punk album, just like I will. But it's it's just not your thing. But when it's not our thing. And why do I like the Daft Punk album? Because it's a it is by definition a strong throwback to the seventies in disco, and I mean even has it even has the story of the connection to the original pioneers of disco in the album built into the album. They tell the story. Um, so if from and, and that connects back to a time when I was actually alive. I was a I little I don't a little think teeny that's baby. What the, I don't think that's what the story is. I think it's the inventor of the synthesizer. I'm just saying it's a different thing. We don't know as much but about But he talks it. about that he, ta- he talks about that beat, the click track and stuff. Uh, I'm just saying that like it's literally a throwback and it's got a, it's got a historical angle and that's why we like it. But if things get too on the cutting edge of the future, we don't like it anymore. And, and unless you're really really hip and I don't want to be that hip. I'm not that dad. <laughs> I don't know. I think we could, about, talk about, we, we, could have, we could have easily made this into an episode, by the way, and we just made it into one question. So maybe we'll have to come back to well, I, this you subject. Know, for, for the next listening party, Britton and I are working. We were like, we got to do something. We got to do some music that's now. So I, I think by the time this comes out, it would have come out. But we decided we were only going to play music for each other. That is music that's moving us now, like brand new music. Like over the weeks or months old. And I had to get excited about it in a different way because it, it was more <laughs> difficult to get excited about. But I but there's lots of music that's moving me. So it can happen. Yeah, I mean yeah. I I agree. Um let's move on to another question. This one's from Rafa Conrad. Uh what is your perspective about fandoms? Okay, it's it's interesting because um, I've been thinking more about more about fandoms lately. Um, because, and I think this is true for you too. I'll just speak for myself. I I wouldn't consider myself. I, I've never experienced being a part of a fandom. Now, I, obviously, I'm excluding the fact that. You know, that we, th- there's a fandom around what we do. There's a mythical fandom. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. And I'm, I'm very reverent towards uh, what, how, how people are, have created it as a fandom. But it is, it, it's, I observe it from the, I don't want to say from the top down or from the outside in, but like, I mean, a fandom formed around the stuff that we create, but I don't, even though I'm very passionate about a lot of things, I don't think that I could say that I've ever actually been a part of a fandom. And I'll, I will tease that I gained some insight 
through some recent experiences, which I'll talk about in a second, but I just wanted to put that out there at first. Have we have have either one of us ever been a part of a fandom? And how do we define fandom? Do we need to look that up like craft work? I mean, you can look it up, but I'll give you my layman's definition. You can see if Google agrees with me. Yeah. I, I think it's it's a group of people who have connected with each other because they have connected with all connected together a, around something else that they like. Yeah. Fans of a particular person, team, fictional series, et cetera, regarded collectively as a community or subculture. So yeah, no, community. See, I, would, I, I, would, yeah, I think that the, the, for me, the community aspect is the thing. So I would consider, I'm probably... I'm the the most I'm a part of a fandom is a fan of NC State athletics. I mean that 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 that's the easiest thing, right? So my college, Lynx College. So it isn't like I have a group of people that I get together with and watch games, but I have like you know a couple of our college buddies that I'll talk to about a big game or something like that. I mean there are there's like a group of NC State people that get together. At like a bar in Pasadena and watch, really <laughs> watch games together. You you ever and there thought was about a time? Going? I've thought about it. I don't think I'm going to do it, but I have thought about it um, because you know, especially when you, the thing about being a part of a fandom is that you relate in this way, and when you're an NC State sports fan, you relate in a very particular way of like having your hopes dashed against the rocks of yeah. reality over and over again for decades and decades. And that makes you a certain type of fan, right? And so there's a connection there, just a like-mindedness that you don't even have to think about when you meet somebody. Oh, and if you see somebody with an NC, like the thing is, is that like the the block S from Stanford is exactly the same as the block S from NC State, except the NC State has N and C kind of small in there. And so you, I, I, when I first moved out here, I saw all these block S's and I was like, state, no, Stanford, state, no, Stanford, state. You never see somebody wearing anything NC State. But Until it's you happened do. maybe five and like, times Whoa. in 10 years. And yeah. I talk to these people. Yeah, because, I talk to them. Because there's so much I don't suffering. talk to anybody. It's, it's basically like in medieval times, if you, got, if you get thrown in a dungeon and you're like in the blocks and you're like, you're in the shackles. What are you gonna do? You're gonna start. You're gonna start talking to the guy or the gal next to you. You know, you're gonna. Hey, you're gonna. You're gonna connect in the misery of being in that situation. That's what it's like to be a Wolfpack fan. And so, right. you, if you're gonna endure the heart wrenching, and you've opted, loss, you've opted out. By I've the opted way, out. you've opted out of that. I've opted out. I mean, I love. I love NC State. I love my experience, but I just cannot. When it comes to the. The sports experience, I cannot stand being being trampled um, and then getting my hopes up just enough to think that it's not going to happen the time after or the time after that. Yeah, I get it. But so, so yeah, there's a, you, you have this need for connection. I mean, my, my insight came when, and, you know, I was talking about how Lily and I started watching John Mayer's live Instagram show called Current Mood, which is roughly comes out every week. Um, you know, we're both big fans of his music. Our families are big fans of his music. You know, we're middle-aged white guys. What are we supposed to do? But Yeah, you got to like John Mayer. But like our you kids lose are your into card it. if you don't like John Mayer. Lily, Lily's really into it, and she got me into Current Mood. And I've it was such a different experience because... Well, it was live, so there was like more of a connect. We've done a lot of live stuff, and we really built, we really started to build our community when we were doing that Retin Link Cast Live. There is something magical about knowing that this is happening now, and if I type something, he might, he might read it, he might respond to it. There could be a little conversation, some acknowledgement. Um, but even beyond that, when it, when an episode was over and I was reflecting on it, I just started to appreciate specifics about it, like why I was really into it. You know, the fact that he has a certain sense of humor, but he also talks about things that are serious and he processes things in an interesting way and he thinks in a similar way 
to mm-hmm. me. I started to relate on that level. And I started to become curious how many other people had that type of experience. And here I am in bed. I'm on Reddit anyway. I'm like, I bet you there's a John Mayer Reddit thread. I wonder if there's a current mood Reddit thread. Because I didn't want to just talk about, I didn't want to be a fan of John Mayer. I wanted to talk about the sh- that show specifically and like the episode I had just watched. I found myself wanting to discuss it with other people. Um, and there there wasn't one. There, there was a John Mayer Reddit thread. Oh, and some people would talk I, about current mood. I was mood, sure but, that you were going to say that there was. So I, I actually found that I was frustrated that there wasn't and I, I ain't going to start it. I ain't got time for that. But sometimes there's a current mood entry in the John Mayer thread. And I don't even know what John Mayer fans are called, if they have a name, like how they associate themselves in the fandom. But again, I'm speaking of it as if I'm not involved in it. But I'm, I've gotten as close as I, as I have to saying that I'm in a fandom because I found myself wanting to just talk to people about somebody else's work and connect over it. And I don't think, I mean, I really like connecting and talking to people about music and, but music is not a fandom, you know, it's got to be a specific thing. And it actually started. Hold on. You mean when you put on your dating profile that you like music, that doesn't mean anything. Right. (laughs) Right. Uh, And for the record, I do not have a dating profile. So I don't know what Rhett's referring to. But if you did. You wouldn't say I'm really into music. I would put I, I would I would I would put I'm I like listening to music. That's a hobby of mine. But when when I say that, I really mean it. Like I like to sit down and listen to music, and I like to think about it, and I like to talk about it. So I'm not some I, I'm not just somebody who says yeah I like music. Yeah I like I like food. I like yeah, to eat. Saying food, I, like I like music, to music, to music is like I like food. Right. I like sunshine. But I started to think. I gained insight into how the mythical beasts enjoy our content because there's when you really get something and I feel like, you know, the mythical beasts really get us. I think that's what that's what it means to be a mythical beast that you watch it and you you understand why it's they well, want to connect to us. We we they you know, connect to we what we create, whole, they connect to who we are and I started to I started to understand that for the first time. About this. There, yeah, if somebody book, likes what you the like, about, then you like yeah. them. Because because we talked about Merle Haggard, I, and I think that right. the, the the thing the the thing that we didn't do, me and you connected with each other right over our love for Merle, but we didn't connect with the greater fandom because when we went to the concerts, it was a bunch of sixty five year old people. <laughs> it was right. like, and, and I'm not Britain, you know what I'm saying? Like your cousin Britain. Right will go to a horror convention and come back best friends with a 94-year-old woman. It's like, I, you know, and that's awesome. And I wish I was more open to personal connection than that. But I just, I'm not. So it was like, oh, my friend likes this. This is something we connect. But the greater community of people who would call themselves mayor heads or whatever, mm-hmm. mayors, maybe they just call themselves mayors. They're all mayors of mayor town. John Mayer fans. Um, I don't know. It, it, to to some extent, it feels like a commitment. It's the same reason I don't go. I, I consider myself an NC State sports fan, but I don't go to that bar to watch NC State lose in sports mm-hmm. with other people. Uh, because you gotta com- you, you, you gotta commit. You got to commit not just to the thing that you like. You have to commit to the other people who like it. Yeah, it, there's a lot more time involved. And I think I found myself, if there was a John Mayer, if there was a current mood discussion, like that was reliable every week, like I in this environment right now, being home so much, like I, I could see myself starting to make friends in that environment and start, you know, it's... um you know, Mike, our friend Science Mike, he's big into Dungeons and Dragons. He talks to us about it, but he talks about how he'll play and and he has a group of friends that he plays with that um some of them were 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 members of his community who also like Dungeons and Dragons and were part of that community. So then they would 
form their own little group. But I mean, I mean, you got the whole Trekkie thing that was the the quintessential beginning of Con. fandoms in my mind. When you go to a convention and then you would be make friends with those people, and that was. Yeah. But I, I think in this environment, and by the way, by con, I did not mean the wrath of con. I just meant conventions. Yes, you did. But there is a double meaning, and you have to specify when you're talking about Star Trek. Or Star Trek, as I said, until I was like 13. <laughs> Uh, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I need to go full in on a fandom in order to then be a better. What are we? Figureheads of the mythical fandom? Figurehead is someone well, who really doesn't do anything, but it well, kind of. There, there, there's a. There's a. And careful with that. <laughs> there's a very specific opportunity, given the fact that there's two of us. Because you could become part of my fandom (laughs) and I could become part of your fandom. And that's how we fully participate in the mythical fandom. It's just like, hey, I'm a big fan of the mythical, mythical stuff. But really, it's you're going to start tweeting that I you're going to start tweeting about all (laughs) you know, when Link said so and so, so and so, like, wasn't that wasn't that cool? I'm going to I'm going to start like a I'm going to start a Twitter account that's like. Link's ocean blue eyes or something like that <laughs> and tweet about you constantly. That's what I'm going to do. Um, what are you, how, what are you going to do about me? I'm already, I'm already really close to being a mayor head. I think that's where I'm going to go. <laughs> well, I'm not committing to you if you don't commit to me. <laughs> we, we have enough commitments to each other. We don't need to be each other's biggest fan. Okay. Let's let's do let's do one more question. All right. Uh, this one's from Michelle. Very practical. Thoughts about using a blanket on the couch? Does it need to be folded or put away after each use, even if you know you're going to just pull it out next time? My husband says yes, but I say no. I literally use a blanket on the couch year round. Uh, we use a blanket on the couch year round. I mean, th- there's certain blankets that our entire family has, um, they consider the best blanket. And so then we bought a weighted blanket. And for a little bit, the weighted blanket became the coveted blanket that everyone fought over. You had to get on there. You had to get underneath at first as like calling a shotgun. But then turns out the weighted blanket was too heavy, too weighted. So now the second most popular blanket has now become the most too popular heavy blanket for again. Uh, for most people, it gets too warm, and it's and you could injure yourself moving it. I don't like the weighted blanket because I could hurt my shoulders trying to pick that thing up and move it. I got to preserve you, that well, for surfing. How did you hurt yourself? Well, I tried to move a weighted blanket. So our second most popular blanket became the coveted blanket. And again, I'm I'm looking at it over there, and it's gone. Somebody's got it, and we just bought a second one. We should have bought five of them. So. I will say so there's every, always blankets when you laying watch around. a movie together when you watch a movie together everyone has a blanket all five yeah pretty yeah, yeah it's interesting because um, when we watch a movie together they all have blankets and I just I'm I, I don't I just don't quite get it I'm kind of well, like are you warm natured you're a little warm natured no I'm actually I get cold most of the time when you say that you're cold I'm like when I think about it, I'm like, yeah, it is a little cold. I just honestly you should get a blanket. I don't, I don't think about it as much. And I like a blanket. I think it's just I just assume that it's not going to be big enough. I just assume that all blankets oh. don't won't fit me, and so I just it's like it's the reason I, I don't try things on at stores. I'm like, it's not going to fit me. Our favorite blanket is big enough for you, man. It's such a big blanket. You can I take that blanket and I can. I can hold it. It's it's about it's like a six by eight blanket. That would fit me. Now, but we do. We, so we have a lot of blankets, you know, on the couch. Well, with, there's at least two. Uh, for some reason, there's usually two. And since three of them want blankets, they get in fights. And I don't know why we haven't done the math on this. But my wife is cleaning up constantly, um, and the rest of us are. My kid's significantly worse than me creating mess. Yeah. Right. Uh, 
And it's interesting now, given quarantine, because we don't have anybody over, right? So Jesse likes to get the house real nice for people who don't live in it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, uh, um, but we've been keeping it pretty clean, but I got to say that the blankets have just been nonchalantly thrown over the couch and sort of left in place for, I'd say weeks now with no, like there's no folding and putting away. And now if she gets into a, cl- a cleaning mindset, they will be folded and put away only to be taken out again. Even in this environment, I think that creates a lot of problems. I mean, you can anticipate my position on this. I think that blankets should be folded and not put Why away. What, they should be what, folded what and problems? put problems. When you walk up to a couch and there's a blanket that someone's been in on it, and it's like just like a clump of blanket. But folding doesn't make it cleaner. It is not inviting because it says someone else has been in this. Someone else's body, body smells and skin cells and stuff is, is all in it. Now, if you fold it up, that statement's still true, but it doesn't, it Even doesn't more make you, so. it doesn't make you think about it. It doesn't but logically, make you think someone else has been cells, in this blanket. But the other parts of the person that came off of them and got on the blanket are now folded up and they're multiplying when it's folded. No, they're not. At least when it's out in the open, it's they're dying. It's not the pieces, laid out. The pieces t- of the person a, are dying. It's in a clump. It's like a brain. It's smushed together and there's all. T- there's even more crevices. There's even think, more crevices. You think the viruses that are on the people are being crushed by the blanket? being folded not true well, i don't want to talk about viruses at all i just think um, that it's not inviting to go into like if a shirt's hanging on a rack you're like i could try that on if the shirt's laying in the bottom of a you know uh the the, the stall i don't want to try that on even though someone else has already tried on both of those shirts to use your okay let me ask you a different question that's related to this when your wife goes out of town and you're at home alone. Do you make the bed? And why? Um, I I like to make the bed because then if I if I take a nap, I like to take a nap on top of the bed because if I get under the covers, then that's not a nap. That's sleeping. Well, I was trying to trap you because your logic of other people's parts doesn't apply when it's just you sleeping in a bed, right? I, it's I just, just think your it, parts. it's just more exciting when you walk in a room and there's like there's a blanket here and it's folded and there's a blanket draped over here strategically. It's like oh, and then it also it send when something's in clumps, it sends a signal to the other people in the house, the kids, that you know what? Oh, I can leave my chip bag here. I can leave my half drunk can of Lacroix here. I can leave so my you think fully a clean- drunk. Can look at a clean a, house it sets starts a tone. with a clean bed. Yeah, now listen, it sets a tone. Uh, I don't agree. Um, and as you might guess, I do not make the bed when I'm sleeping alone in it. Um, and my wife makes the bed literally, is she like the like she can't start her life if the bed isn't made. And I don't every do that. single time, I don't make the bed every morning. But I do like a made bed. But every single time I'm participating in the making of the bed, because if I happen to get caught in the room at the time when she's doing it, I got long arms. I look like I'm made to make beds. Yeah. I have to help. I get recruited. And every single time I'm doing it, I have a number of thoughts. I'm flooded with thoughts. One of them is there's got to be a better system. Like, there, there, there's got to be something that is closer to a sleeping bag. You know what I'm saying? Like I just, the, the multiple sheets and the way things have to fold down and, and don't get me started on a freaking down comforter. I'm sure your wife has the same thing. Our wives get yeah. similar things, but it's this down comforter that has a du- a duvet cover. And then you have to pull it in and then re- and fold it backwards and like tie it in a certain, when we start doing that, I start going ballistic every single time. I'm just like, I don't understand. Why is this the system? This has been around for who knows how many hundreds of years. And this is the way we're still doing it. 
I would gladly make the bed if it was like Jetson's time and we figured out a way to just do it efficiently and cleanly. But I get mad at the antiquated nature of it and it just makes me think, I'm above this. I'll just come back to this tonight and I'll work my way into it and it'll be fine. We're talking about blankets though. <laughs> so I think the same thing applies. Of course, I think the same thing applies to blankets. If you're not going to have guests, because I do agree that if you go to somebody's house and you're like, oh, there's a bundled up blanket on their couch. Ew, I don't, that means somebody drooled there or worse. And, but if, if it's just me and my family, I know who was on the couch last night. I was there. We were watching a movie together after we argued about which one it would be. I, I don't make I, my kids I fold blankets. Blanket. I, don't, I, I don't make them do that, but I do it because I like it. But I recognize it as a matter of taste. So it makes me happy, but I don't, I don't enforce that on the kids because I don't think that would be fair. So I, I think that's the compromise. I admit that it's a matter of taste. Well, so is Michelle right or is her husband right? Because that's really what this comes down to. You're saying that her husband is right. I'm saying that. You no, know, I don't think it's a, I think it's a matter of taste. It's not a matter. You have to live together and, you know, you, yeah, you got to meet I think the, the situation here, I think that the situation is easy. If her husband believes that the uh, blankets need to be folded and put away, well, he can do it. That's what I'm saying. Don't don't drag Michelle into it. Yeah. Yeah. I do agree with that. And okay. I'll give a little wreck here. Today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wreck. Thanks for giving us these um, these questions, these topics of conversation. I learned lots of stuff. Sounds like I might get to go surfing again soon. Um, a little wreck for you guys. I mean, I could just wreck that documentary because, it. yeah, if you're our age, and you and you were into basketball and want to relive the Jordan glory days. That's great. I think if I think if you care about sports at all, Let, I'll, it, I'll make that incredible. I'll make that the wreck, the last dance. I'm not. I've got at least one more episode, and um, like Phil Jackson is an interesting person. Like we haven't mm -hmm. talked about this, but I'm like, man, what a what a someone who doesn't fit the mold for his particular job. Such, such an interesting guy. I wish they would have talked more about him. I want to see a Phil Jackson documentary. Well, you know, the guy who directed uh, The Last Dance also did a documentary on Andre the Giant. I've seen that one then. Yeah. That was good, too. Um, but he's also done like two or three other ones. He just oh he's because he's I think he did one on the Pistons maybe he did one on an, another another team I think that I could I don't think it has to be the Chicago Bulls I think I'm I think I'm really opening myself up to sports documentaries in general oh, thirty for thirties all right last dance that's our recommendation uh, hashtag ear biscuits let us know what you think about these topics if that's blankets or reliving a uh, a point in, in your life or all the stuff we said about music let us have it we'll speak at you next week to watch more ear biscuits click on the playlist on the right to watch the previous episode of ear biscuits click on the playlist to the left and don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe if you prefer to listen to this podcast it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms thanks for being your mythical best